My name is Mary Hesdorfer. I'm a nurse practitioner and the executive director of the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation. The informational videos, like the one you are currently watching, has been made possible by the generous support of our donors and our sponsors. They have made the commitment to ensure that the work of this foundation continues in the face of this global pandemic. I am very grateful. Please take a moment to note who they are and if possible to thank them for their commitment to the foundation and the community. Thank you. Hello, my name is Pritesh Shah. I am the Chief Commercial Officer at Novacure. Novacure was founded 20 years ago with the mission to extend survival in the most aggressive forms of cancer with our innovative therapy tumor treating fields. In May 2019, tumor treating fields was approved in combination with chemotherapy to treat people with unresectable, locally advanced, or metastatic malignant pleural mesothelioma, the first FDA approved treatment in over 15 years for mesothelioma. Novacure is proud of our treatment, which may help patients live longer, and a proud sponsor of the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation. Novacure shares MARF's mission to end mesothelioma and the suffering caused by cancer by offering hope, support, education, and innovation. Hi, my name is Joe Bellick, and I'm the founding partner of the Law Offices of Bellick and Fox. We support the mesothelioma community by providing first quality legal representation to mesothelioma patients and their families. During these troubling times, we're proud to support the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation so they can continue the work that they do every day on behalf of mesothelioma patients and their families. We're continuing to do the work that we do and we support the Mesothelioma Research Foundation in continuing to do their work. Hello, I'm Samantha Devine and I'm a physician assistant at UPMC Hillman Cancer Center. Our program offers the most advanced treatment for patients with mesothelioma. We're proud to support the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation because of the great work they do in raising awareness for this disease. I want to thank the entire team from the University of Maryland for being willing to participate in this interview today. Uh, what we're trying to do is bring pertinent information to mesothelioma patients and their family members as well as people in the general public and lung cancer patients, information about what's happening at the various centers, uh, what's important for mesothelioma uh, patients to know and understand about uh, COVID-19 and its effect on possible treatments, surgeries, et cetera. And also, um, I understand um, Dr. Freeberg and Melissa from our conversation a couple of weeks ago, uh, you've really have taken some innovative steps to be able to continue with your tumor board um, and I guess what we'll, I'll do is maybe uh, ask you to start and maybe Melissa, you can talk a little bit about, you know, what a tumor board is and what, you know, why it's so important in, in you know, in working with cancer patients in general. Right. So um, absolutely, probably the most important thing for all mesothelioma patients is that they're cared for by a team. Um, and I think a team of experts dedicated to coming up with the best possible treatments, what's available, not only at their own institution, but also connecting patients where they need to be. So um, uh, I've had the privilege of being part of mesothelioma tumor boards, um, patient conferences for many, many years. And, and now at the University of Maryland, we've, we've kind of taken the next step in, in continuing to stay connected with our patients. And, and our nurse practitioner, Erica, has really spearheaded making sure that we still meet every week. And she's really, it's, it's seamless. So I'm gonna pass the baton to Erica and she can talk to you about the details of how she's making it happen. Wonderful. And Erica, could you introduce yourself and your role at the University of Maryland? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my Thank name you. is Erica Glass and I'm a nurse practitioner um, I work with Dr. Friedberg and Melissa um, on, on the thoracic surgery team here at the University of Maryland. Um, and a large part of my role is taking care of the mesothelioma patients from um, you know, speaking with them when they're initially diagnosed through kind of ensuring they get all of their, their uh, preoperative studies if they're a surgical candidate and then um, of course following them after surgery. 
um, and a big part of that um, is, is uh, tumor board. I always say I don't like the term tumor board just because I think it sounds crude, um, but then if we call it a patient conference, patients get confused and think that they have to show up. So, um, so we'll call it a tumor board just, uh, just for clarification. But um, so in general, our, our tumor boards meet in person, um, but because of the, the crisis, we've transitioned to an online platform. Um, so Zoom actually um, has two versions, which I didn't know. There's a free version and then there's a, a paid version, which is a um, HIPAA compliant version. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've been using the paid version and everybody who, who would participate in the conference in person is actually coming and participating um, online uh, in the conference. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the platform is you're able to uh, not only video like we are right now, but also um, share your screen. So the radiologist is able to show images, the pathologist is able to show um, pathology slides. So uh, I, I don't think we've noticed really any difference other than perhaps, um, you know, it, people might be speaking over one another and it's difficult if there's a delay because someone's on a mm -hmm. cell phone. Um, but it's really been very seamless. Um, and we've just asked our patients to mail their imaging in advance if they're not physically coming here, if we're doing telemedicine appointments instead. Um, and I, I think it's been, uh, really, really wonderful. Um, I, I don't think we really have thought about this, this capability before, but, um, you know, now we can have conferences really, no matter what happens, as long as we have the internet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Freeberg, so, uh, you know, following these, you know, the tumor board and following these conferences, I would imagine then the next step would be for you to be involved in uh, the telemedicine, you know, call with a patient. So, and for a patient to prepare for these calls, what type of information would you like that patient to have at their fingertips? I know you've correct, collected the medical information, but what would you like to know more about the patient when they present themselves onto one of these Zoom calls um, where you're going to be dialoguing with the medical team? Right. I, you know what's really nice about this, uh, this platform, at least with thoracic surgery, is that it's really not that much different than when we meet in person. Mm -hmm. uh, so for some things like say vascular problems where you have to feel a pulse or you know, test capillary refill, the physical exam is so important. Mm -hmm. But if we have someone's films and we can talk to them and, you know, and I think there's a certain element of just being able to look at somebody, mm -hmm. um, but if we can, look at their films, which we've already done. We have their lab studies and so forth to review. And we can talk to them. It's really not that much different than a regular office visit, whether it's in person or, or like this by video. So we're able to just go through the usual set of questions. You know, how are you feeling? What do you do during the day? Have you lost mm -hmm. any weight? Do you have any pain? Um, if it's somebody that we're seeing, uh, you know, at this point, Usually for us, it's moot whether they had asbestos exposure or not, if they have a diagnosis of mesothelioma, but we get referred patients who say have a recurrent pleural effusion and it's, we're suspicious, then you know, we can ask about asbestos exposure, try and gauge our index of suspicion that this might be mesothelioma, for instance. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's basically all the things that a patient, there's, there's nothing different about this format. It's really the same thing that we would do in a regular office visit. Mm -hmm. and to be candid uh, with Zoom, it's almost, we've been interested in this because it is so easy for thoracic surgery where mm -hmm. so much of the story is actually in the, in the x-rays and what the patient says more so than the physical examination. We've been interested in this for a while and we had a patient, gosh, it must be almost two years ago now. She wanted to, she was a little bit on the infirm side and she was from South Carolina, we're in Baltimore and she wanted her whole family to be there. And we did a telemedicine visit, if you will, back then where she had her entire family. I mean, like her grand, I mean, there, there must've been eight or 10 people with her in her living room and we had the visit. So it's almost in some sense, uh, better. I mean, it's easier for people to, to join. They can be wherever they are. They don't, you know, the, the kids don't have to take off from work to drive mom in. Uh, and everyone has to take off from work if they want to be there. And sometimes they get on the phone. 
if you have something like this, I mean, I just came off a meeting where there were, you know, probably 25 people and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, everyone can participate. So it actually mm -hmm. worked out pretty well. Thank you. So uh, I think I have a question for Erica now. Um, Erica, I believe that we spoke about, or I think that you had said that you were um, going to be working with community physicians as well, that they would have an opportunity perhaps to be invited into your tumor board. Uh, to present a local case to you. Am I correct? Is that something that uh, you're branching into as well? Yeah, um, we, we actually, um, we've had that a couple of times. We've had uh, the opportunity to have physicians call in. Now, um, in the, using the Zoom platform, we would actually be able to um, conference them in uh, mm -hmm. via webcam so that they would be able to see everything. Um, prior to now, we have um, just had them phone in. But it's, it's wonderful because if they have a question uh, say, for example, um, a, a person might be a candidate for proton radiation. Well, we've got the radiation oncologist in the room. So rather than that uh, community physician having to make three different phone calls, he can sort of ask the questions of all the physicians that are there. So um, it really saves a lot of time and, and I think opens up more opportunities for patients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Erica, are you doing consultations also with patients, um, you know, outside of the tumor board yourself as a nurse practitioner now? Is that a role that you've taken on in addition? Yeah, yeah. So I meet mean, um, every mesothelioma patient that um, that comes in for consultation, whether that's by mm -hmm. uh, telemedicine or in person. Um, mm -hmm. And and uh, you know, it's it's helpful not only to sort of know the patient from the beginning, but also just to introduce mm -hmm. who I am and um, and and what I could do to help. Right, and I know that you have a excellent background also in radiation oncology, which so few of us have. Um, yeah. And intent, you know, and and when we get together at these meetings we tend not to have that rat on nurse. So right. to have you as a resource for this community with that rich background and able to field some of these questions, I think it's very important for people to know that you are a resource, that you know, yeah. they have the ability to connect with you through the University of Maryland's health system via Zoom for some of the questions that you know, maybe they're not having answered or maybe you know, some of the fears they have um, yeah. Or just you know symptom side effects from radiation. So I you know I think it's really important to have you as a member of the team. So thank you. Yeah, thank and you. Melissa, I know uh, you have a wealth of experience in uh, in you know in nursing patients with rep respiratory diseases, and you know have worked in you know uh, in you know in the more intensive type setting, and have actually gone over to Japan to teach nurses about care of mesothelioma patients. So. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about, you know, what you're doing with your patient population, you know, separate from, you know, from just the tumor board. Well, I think, I think a lot of what we're doing right now is really uh, kind of alleviating fears. Patients mm -hmm. call almost every day um, with questions about the symptoms they're having and where do I go, what do I do. So I think, I, I think being being a, a connection for all of our patients, not only our mesothelioma patients, but all of our patients that are, you know, facing lung cancer and other malignancies, they really need mm -hmm. to feel that they can stay connected in a world that's really isolated them at a very, very poor time in their lives. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, just talking people um, down off the ledge a little bit and say, and say, no, this, that's not a symptom, but if you do have a symptom, this is where you would go. Uh, and I think that's, that's a big role that we're playing right now um, uh, for, for, for all of our patients. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I know you've served as a resource to me as well, um, particularly with the hospitalized patients who are in acute situations, because, you know, you have that expertise. You have you know, spent so many years you know, caring for patients, both on the inpatient and outpatient setting. So, you know, I'm glad that I have you personally as a resource, but that our patients do as well. So, um, Joe, I have a question for you. I'm Dr. Freeberg, sorry. I, I have a question, question for you first. Did you just yes. call Melissa old? Was that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I oh. thought I put enough makeup on. <laughs> oh, you just said she was scared. Okay, all right, sorry, go on. I interrupted. I mean, I'm older than dirt. How can I call anybody old at this point? But <laughs> anyway, so my question to you, I guess, is, you know, you are so involved and you've been a leader in uh, surgical research, you know, um, you know, developing guidelines and protocols and looking at, you know, how do we quantify the uh, surgeries and outcomes? You know, it, it seems like now so much is on hold, but I would imagine that 
despite you know the medical research being on hold a bit, surgical research now will continue. I don't think that we're going to see a setback. Am I correct? Are you able to still access your protocols and collaborate with surgeons around the country with some of the data points you've been trying to collect? I mean, I think the surgery right now is on pause just mm -hmm. uh, with respect to what's going on. I mean, a lot of places are, including our hospital right now, our main hospital is, you know, life-threatening within 72 hours. Right. So mm -hmm. surgery is not being done for this right now, as far as I know, in most places, mm -hmm. not that there's a lot of places that, that mm -hmm. do this. I mean, there's other cancer surgery, more mm -hmm. routine, you know, stage one lung cancer and so forth that's going on. But as far as the collaborative research, uh, you know, that's absolutely still going and this platform mm -hmm. again lends itself well to that. So mm -hmm. we're collaborating with other surgeons and working on these different projects that is absolutely going on. So now um, you're, you know, like obviously you're working from home today. So from what I understand, you're all on staggered schedules so that, you know, it keeps the surgical team healthy that, you know, you're, right. you're not way putting all your resources in the hospital at the same time as there's right. that fear of contagion. So anyway, okay. Joe, I, you know, I, I feel, you know, it's in my heart for all of you that, you know, are confronting this on a daily basis. But how often are you at the hospital? Um, how many cases are you doing? Um, you know, what's happening with you today? So I didn't go in today. We've divvied it up that um, we basically cover four hospitals where we operate mm -hmm. and uh, there's, there's five of us. So mm -hmm. we, um, we divvy it up. Certain people are covering certain places. Uh, mm -hmm. One of my partners and I cover the, the VA hospital and the main university hospital. I didn't go in today. He's rounding on my patients. I was mm -hmm. there on um, Monday. I did a big operation. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I rounded on everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are trying to limit expo exposure as much as possible. Right. So I spoke to Dr. Sturman the other day in New York and, you know, we sort of caught up what was happening at NYU. Um, what is the situation like in Baltimore right now with COVID-19? I mean, knock on wood right now, we're, we're pretty, pretty low. Certainly nothing like New York at this point. Now they're saying, mm -hmm. the, the conference call I just got off, they're predicting that we should peak. The modeling now says April, I think, 28th or 29th. Mm -hmm. so, so about a month from now is when they're expecting it to, um, to be, uh, you know, to peak. Mm -hmm. Our hospital is, you know, crazy prepared. I mean, they have plans to extend up to, I think, almost 500 ICU beds. Mm -hmm. And then, mm -hmm. you know, and also the, they're making a field hospital out of the convention center and the Hilton, Host uh, the Hilton Hotel. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, hopefully we'll be prepared that we would not be overrun. Uh, right. you know, like in Italy, for instance, and you know, I, I think we're blessed. Our governor, I think, has been ahead of the curve. Governor uh, uh, Hogan, excellent, excellent. Yeah, he's yeah. really, you know, he's delivered a consistent, strong message. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, oh, you're in the state as well. So, I mean, I think he's done a really terrific job. Maybe you know the best, and I think he's done a lot to protect us. Mm -hmm. So, it's um. It's a surgical mindset, you know, prepare for the worst and hope for the best, <laughs> you know, right. so I'm kind of yeah. used to thinking like that. And I think mm -hmm. that's the way the system is responding right now as well. And your hospital, I mean, uh, you know, is so well trained, you know, being, you know, considered experts in the field of shock trauma that right. you're, you know, you have those teams in place. Um, you're not working with just a few people who can run a vent, but you've got a number of people who can walk into the critical care unit and take control and really keep things running effectively. Right. Um, Absolutely. I mean, barring some sort of real catastrophe, I think we're unlikely, you know, to be one of those places where you hear about a, you know, first year radiology resident running an ICU that that seems pretty darn unlikely here, but, you know, mm -hmm. we're prepared for anything. Yeah. So, um, I guess, Melissa, I'll go back to you. Is there anything that you'd like to convey to mesothelioma patients who are listening to this? I, I think one one area that we are noticing um, an impact also is in clinical research, as you had mentioned, um, that that we aren't unless it's COVID related, 
um, we're not putting through new clinical trial protocols and patients are being encouraged that are on clinical trials not to come into the hospital and we're, we're diverting patients to uh, telemedicine visits and follow up. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I would say that patients that are involved in clinical trials and interested to continue to be interested and stay in touch with their with their teams this mm -hmm. you know this will go away someday and we want to be ready to you know take care of everybody and, and get things back in order so that's mm -hmm. that's one area that I, I I've, I've noticed that is impacted pretty heavily right now mm -hmm. um, I also serve on the University of Pennsylvania's IRB and had a meeting today um, and and you know COVID studies are being prioritized as they should but mm -hmm. other other protocols are going through so it's we're going to be ready when it's time but I, I would tell patients not to lose hope to stay mm -hmm. connected don't be afraid of telemedicine don't be afraid to get on your computer um, it mm -hmm. does make a difference you know seeing people as opposed to just talking to them on the phone so for our older patients that are not comfortable with that i would say give it a try um, and, and I think it'll help them feel better because they can at least see the person on the other line. Right. And I understand that, um, you know, even with HIPAA and with Medicare, Medicaid, if patients don't have access to Zoom or to a video that they're able to do telephone calls as well. Mm -hmm. So right. I think that's important. So I wanted to let uh, the three of you know as well that what we have done as a foundation, we have actually engaged now a uh, psychiatrist and trained, uh, so, you know, um, psychologists now to work with the population. So our patients, our caregivers and bereaved now have um, expert groups run by people with an expertise, um, particularly with the trauma associated with COVID-19. Um, and you know, it affects all of the groups that we run. So we'll continue to have um, you know, our warm fuzzies where we get together with phone calls with patients, but then we now have these professionally led groups too just to make sure that we're covering the needs that need to be um, you know, taken care of. So, um, hey Mary. Eric, yes. I, mm -hmm. So the one thing I wanted to um, say, one thing that our, our team is really cognizant of and not just on the mesothelioma side, but on the lung cancer side, yes. the things we deal with, we fully recognize and are very sensitive to the fact that if someone has cancer, mm -hmm. especially mesothelioma for them, this is a more significant problem and a greater threat than, than, than this virus. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we understand that and, you know, someone has a problem, they shouldn't be like, you know, the, the teams are overrun with the, I mean, we will, it's actually easier for us to arrange a visit now mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> than, than it was when, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's easier for us to arrange a visit now than when we had to see them in the office. So, if somebody mm -hmm. has a problem, they shouldn't hesitate and we'll get the ball rolling. You know, we can do mm -hmm. the evaluation. And as far as patients who are a candidate for surgery, mm -hmm. we discussed this at our multidisciplinary conference tumor board uh, mm -hmm. on Monday, kind of the posture that we've adopted because there is no agreement whether the only standard of care treatment for mesothelioma, as you know, is the combination chemotherapy. So we always mm -hmm. incorporate that mm -hmm. into all of our surgery-based treatments as well. And there's no agreement whether giving it before the surgery or after the surgery is, is better mm -hmm. or worse. No, nobody knows at this point. And it's mm -hmm. been our bias to do the surgery first for appropriate candidates and do the chemotherapy afterwards. But within this setting, we've, you know, we've had several patients mm -hmm. that we saw Monday and, uh, you know, they're starting chemotherapy and we will, mm -hmm. you know, see them afterwards when the smoke clears from this pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so they're really not losing any time. And, you know, mm -hmm. just, it, it's hard in the whole greater context to realize, mm -hmm. you know, there are people who, you know, really see a bigger problem for themselves than, than mm -hmm. this, you know, than the virus. And so we are mm -hmm. sensitive to that. I think they should know that. Thank you. And yeah, I, I know that, you know, you've always provided, you know, really great patient care and, you know, people feel that the connection, they feel the warmth, which is so important because I think when the world gets scary, knowing that you have a physician and a nurse practitioner and nurses that care about you, it makes a, it makes a tremendous difference in how you get through that day. 
Right. So, um, Erica, I think you're you're also the first line of contact. Am I correct now? In general, yep. yep. Yes. I mean, okay. Melissa and Dr. Friedberg, of course, are, are available as well. But yes, I right. Have, yes. Obviously. Yeah. Good. Good. So I think you know, putting the face and the name together for people who are going to be okay. you know viewing this yeah, are important. Absolutely. It you know it just takes that unknown away. And, oh gosh, yeah. And um, yeah. I wanted mm -hmm. to um, dovetail on one thing that um, Melissa was talking about. You know, a mm -hmm. lot of people are uncomfortable with telemedicine, or they don't have a smartphone, or they don't know how mm -hmm. to use um, you know the the uh, camera on their computer, but. Um, a lot of hospitals, um, including ours, have a, a no visitor policy. And mm -hmm. uh, if you are there for an outpatient visit, you can only bring one person with you. Um, so I think it makes a lot of sense for everybody to get familiar with this technology. You know, if you mm -hmm. have a loved one that, that, God forbid, is hospitalized with COVID-19, that allows you to stay in touch with them because you won't mm -hmm. be able to visit them. Um, you know, if you, like Dr. Friedberg said, with this Zoom technology, he was able to see a patient and have, you know, eight to 10 family members in the room. So um, I would encourage everybody um, just to, to kind of make sure you're familiar with this because if mm -hmm. you yourself have to be in the hospital, God forbid, or, or a loved one, it really um, makes sure that you're still able to have communication. Mm -hmm. So a question also then, if a new patient were to call you and they need to get records, um, how do they do the consenting today? You know, because they're not in the office signing a consent form yeah. to get things to you. Um, or perhaps from their doctor. Yeah, Can you take you know, verbal we, consents? Yeah, we haven't had any problems. Everybody's been mm -hmm. uh, across the medical um, community. I think everybody's been really cognizant of, of mm -hmm. the um, difficulty doing things in person. Um, mm -hmm. So so I think they have some things in place that are allowing us to, uh, I don't want to say get around it, because of course HIPAA is still respected and, and that's still the, the law. But in terms of maybe being able to take verbal consent, um, we have not seen any um, sort of slow down in, the, in that process of patient referrals. Wonderful. And Melissa, I just want to pick up one more thing that um, that you mentioned. I just, um, so I, I think what you said is that you sit on the IRB for the University of Pennsylvania. So that gives you sort of an inside glimpse of what's, you know, what's sort of being pushed through the, uh, you know, the, these review boards. So research, though it's on pause right now, I think what I understood is that new protocols are still being developed. They'll be developed and held until the time comes. But once we hit the reset button, we're really ready to jump back in. Am I interpreting that correctly? Absolutely, Mary. Um, you know, people in the research community that have been you know, outside of the institution for I think now maybe two weeks, all have been encouraged to continue writing grants, get, getting caught up on, um, protocols that you want to write, getting things submitted to the IRB. IRBs are are fully functional right now. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely prioritizing um, certain protocols as they should, but but you know behind the scenes things are happening. So I'm I'm really encouraged that once once we get the green flag to get started, we should be in good shape um, to 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 reset the button and get going. Wonderful. Thank you. And I want to thank the three of you for taking the time out of your, you know, your busy days and, you know, to help us educate the patient and their family members and um, stay safe, my friends. I look forward to uh, getting together with you all again in a social way as well as professionally. I miss you all and um, I just want to wish you, you know, the best of health as we get through this crisis together. Thank you, Mary. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.